Neo Kohlbergian, just to, uh, to make you aware of what you'll be reading for Tuesday, which is the next chapter starting on page 39. Uh, what is the major, we've talked about this before, what is the major criticism of Kohlberg's thinking? The staircase approach. The assumption is Kohlberg has six stages. And the assumption is you, you have a trajectory. Engineers, a lot of engineers in this class. Your trajectory is path dependency. That means you're, what, once, the, once the path is started, you continue along that trajectory, that line. Where you can stop, but you can't go back. There's no backsliding. So there are several other criticisms in this article uh, with respect to Kohlberg's theory. Uh, and we'll be introduced in the next reading to James Rest. And James Rest is, just out of experience, the thinker that a lot of students will choose for their papers. So it's up to you. You can do Kohlberg, you can do Hammerskjold, you can do Rest. Well, there'll be several others you'll have to choose from as with respect to theory. Hmm? No, we'll be starting the paper after the first test. OK. So because next week is uh, open doors, there's no test next week, It'll be on Tuesday, the 8th of April, the last 30 minutes. It's a test. It's not an exam. So one of the important things that we should emphasize in this reading is that we're talking about somebody's personal history. The speech that we read is, does not present a theory. There's no theory or no theoretical theoretical there's no theoretical approach that we can attribute to Doug Hammerskjold. Who makes a theory out of his speech? The author, Monica Baumann, she's the one who then takes the speech and develops a theoretical approach based on something that he would have said most likely to you today if he had been around to tell his story. So what are some of the key elements that we know from the speech, just having read the speech? What are the, some of the things that we should focus on? Oh, before that. Before that. The context. So we know that, what do we know about uh, Doug Hammarskjöld? He was Swedish. So he grew up in a, what kind of culture? Culture of impunity? Rule of law. So we know from his Swedish, Swedish background that rule of law is something that he would have, as we say, taken in with his mother's milk, something he finds normal. Then somebody said he was a Protestant. So his Christian values. But what else do we know about him? Social Democrats. So somehow rooted in Marxism, which is more important, the issue of social justice. I need to replace this pen. And finally. What else did he, when we're looking about his conventional socialization? Government yeah, government service. On the national level, national <laughs> government service. So these are, these are the things he takes with him on his path to international service. So what is the first thing he has to do with these elements of his character? What does he recommend that we, uh, we all do? When you go from the national or the local level to the international level, 
you have to you have to you have to test them you take your conventional values or your post conventional values and you test them by comparing them exposing them to other people's values either because they're from a different culture or because they think different ideologically. For example, if you're Christian and maybe you're from a working class family in Lebanon, your life will be much different than someone who's Christian and working class family in Sweden, or for that matter in Japan. So that, those differences. But also then, when the cultures have different roots, different traditions, <clears throat> When we compare the, di the, the, the paradigm individual versus group, automatically we're going to see conflicts between Europe and the Middle East. Why? <coughs> yeah, in Europe it's individualistic. <coughs> Whereas in the Middle East, it's more collective or more group-based, individual versus... So the assumption is different. So what, what, once you've exposed your thinking to others, what should you do? You find common ground without sacrificing your own core values or the core values of the institution you're working for. You don't go as far as to say, well, there's so little left that I'll just sacrifice my core values. You shouldn't have that red line, so to speak. These are the things that I won't sacrifice. This is something they're going to have to, uh, you'll find in other writings as well. Where is the red line? Where is the point where you say, no pasaran, I'm not going to go beyond that. The red line are the values that you won't sacrifice. You've heard this in politics, you know. The US always likes to talk about if Syria or Russia crosses the red line, they, they're going to get it. And what happens? Nothing, Nothing right? Okay. But th so it should be a real red line, you know. The red line is, is your limits. I will not sacrifice those core values. Okay. What is the next step we know from the, from the speech? Okay, how do you reach maturity of mind? By one, testing your core values constantly to make sure that what you believe is essential is actually working in your activities as a leader. And finally, yeah. You should be able to criticize your own organization, right? Here again we have loyalty versus truth or honesty. Honesty, very good. But the last point, how do you, what, what uh, exercise, which tool does he recommend that you use on a daily basis? He doesn't actually say daily basis, by the way. He, he just says inner dialogue, very good. That's where we left off. Dialogue. Okay. And we know now that there are others who suggest something similar. What does Martin Luther King call it? Self-purification. What does Franco Barnabe, Barnabe call it? Solitudine, and initiatives of change, quiet time. And there's many other approaches. These are just the four that, that we've chosen or I've chosen for this course. Okay, now let's have a look at the analysis. The analysis of the speech. So what we actually see, what Bauman is now taking the speech and developing a theoretical approach out of the speech. So now let's turn to the, t the analysis after the speech. Um, if you go to page 29 in my handwritten version, which is page 86 and 87. She, in, an, in analyzing his speech, she says, and I'll just read this myself because normally I have students read this, but uh, 
It has to be on the recording. Standing our ground and sticking to our, it's the first full paragraph at the bottom of 86, and sticking to our ideals while performing international service will put us in the line of fire. What other reading did we have so far where you know that if you live up to your ethical principles, you'll be in trouble? Whistleblowers. Whistleblowing, what's the first thing you do if you want to be a whistleblower? You talk to your friends and family. Yeah, very good. To see if they're going to support you or not. And if they're, if, if they're all saying this is a bad idea, most likely you shouldn't do it because you will not stand up to the fire, to the line of fire. Once we have committed ourselves, there will be no slipping back into the old patterns. We will be called on to have courage, courage to see our own mistakes, and courage to point out the mistakes of others even when we encounter a weaker adversary. So, courage. One of the things that a later article will be talking about is exercising. You can actually develop your courage skills, if you will. How do you develop your courage skills? By putting yourself in the line of fire. So if, if you want to stand up for certain principles, go out and let people attack you. But as, he, as, he, as she rightly says, you should also be willing not only to criticize the unethical behavior in your organization or your own ethical behavior, but you should be able to criticize your, yourself. And this is an important point, even when your adversary is weaker than you. No, it's, what's, when they're weaker than you, yeah, I know, but what, do you, what are you tempted to do when your adversary is weaker than you? To exploit the situation. When my adversary is weaker, it's easier to be immoral. Why? Because, because why should I hold back, right? I mean, I can take advantage of that person. That person's weaker than me, I can push them around. So standing up to somebody who's more powerful than you is not ethically challenging. It requires a lot of courage, but it's not ethically challenging. Stand, challenge, fighting against someone who's weaker than you and, stay, and remaining ethical is a problem because you, if, when someone gives you space, you'll, you'll step into it. Okay, now that's page 29. I'll just move on now to the next section where he talks about Russell Davenport. Uh, I, I have some hard copies. I put it on Facebook, so you can go access it. Again, these are, these are Wikipedia entries. Wikipedia entries uh, are academic. You can use Wikipedia as a source in this class for your paper. How do you know whether a Wikipedia entry is an academic or scholarly source? It cites all the sources it uses itself. And Wikipedia will tell you if the entry is not academic. So if it's fully sourced, all of the information in the Wikipedia entry has footnotes, then you can use it. You can always use encyclopedias as a, as a point of departure. Most people do that. They go to Google, you, you type in a keyword, and you, uh, more often than not, it'll, it'll give you a Wikipedia link very quickly. You can use those, especially if they're fully sourced entries. So Russell Davenport, Davenport is well, is, is, is an important source of his thinking, uh, mainly because, as we'll see in a moment, he distinguishes the way we should link science and faith. There are th four key ways of seeing science and faith. We've talked about this once before at the very beginning of the class, but I want to go over it now because the class is now larger. Is science and faith in something divine, something supernatural, something sacred, are science and faith compatible? No. Okay. The one option is, we're talking here about science and faith. The reason this is important is because historically most people get their ethical codes from religion. Obviously this is not the only source because if we go back to the ethics of the 
Hellenistic period of the ancient Greeks, of Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, they don't justify their ethics based on faith. So that option was always available, but in the world today, most people's ethics somehow are rooted in, in religious faith. So the one option is they are mutually exclusive. That means the two of them cancel each other out. You can't have both. So if I'm a, if I'm a scientific person, I can't believe in the spiritual, in the divine. The other says, if I'm, if I'm, if I'm faithful, if I believe in God, I can't really use science. I can't test my faith with scientific methods. So, two, side by side. It means you can be a scientist and you can be a believer in one person, but not at the same time. So when I go into the lab, I check my religious beliefs at the door. And when I go to pray, I leave my science at the door. You can have both as a person, but you can't do both simultaneously at the same time. The third option is that they enrich each other. Albert Einstein is famous for this way of thinking, that a good scientist will also be a believer, and a good believer will also be a scientist. And the fourth option is that they are the same thing. That actually distinguishing between science and religion or science and faith is a fallacy. It's actually one part, there are two parts of a, a holistic approach. So let's see what Hammerskjöld does. Hammerskjöld does not mention religion in his speech. Why would he not mention religion, although he's a Christian and practicing believer? For the audience. He doesn't want to turn people off. If I want to convince you of my thinking, but I know that you might be repelled because of my ref reference to religion, do I need to sacrifice my core values by not mentioning religion? I don't have to I don't have to tell you that my religious beliefs or my ethical beliefs are rooted in religion. I can just tell you my ethical beliefs. And then maybe after the speech, someone will come up and say, well, you know, I had a question here. And then you can talk one to one. So let's see how he places himself in these four options. So Russell Davenport. So uh, I would encourage you, I mean, you can look, at, look that up. It's not really that important for, the, for your paper, for the course. But everybody usually goes back to other thinkers. When you look at somebody's uh, theory or somebody's way of doing things, their methodology, they will reference other people. So when you're, do, when you're actually more advanced in your studies, or some, maybe some of you already are, you'll notice this is like a, uh, like a the telescope. It just goes, goes tick, 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 tick. as you go follow somebody's thinking, it'll go from one thinker to another thinker to another thinker. So, Oh, the reference to Russell Davenport is on page 31 with my handwriting or 90 in the reading. In, on page 32 in my handwriting, he talks about the McCarthy era. Does anybody, there's a C in there, McCarthy, sorry about that. McCarthy era, the 1950s. That's obviously before your time. That's around the time I was born, so I don't remember it either. But does anybody know what that's a reference to? What? Who said yes? OK, over there, yeah. Yeah. During the Cold War, which was the period immediately after, not immediately after, but a few years after World War II. Don't forget, in World War II, the Russians or the Soviets, the French, British, and Americans were fighting on the same side. They didn't agree on many things, but they did agree on their common enemy, which of course was Nazi Germany and um, Imperial Japan, and uh, Italy went along for the ride. So uh, 
after the war, there was a short period of, let's say, five years, a grace period where there was still some, still some cooperation between the U.S. But by the beginning of the 50s, the U.S. and Russia were preparing for a new war, for a war for global domination. It never ended up that way because they both developed nuclear capacity and ended up with something called mutual assured destruction, which coincidentally is called MAD. <laughs> uh, and that basically meant if either side used its weapons, the human race would cease to exist. We would destroy the enti life, human life on the entire planet. By the way, in parentheses, this is why the US is so keen now on pointing out that Russia no longer is a global power. This is sort of an indirect threat to the, the Russians. If they don't watch their step, the US still has its capacity. But the Russians don't anymore. So during this period, uh, we not only had a conflict between the Soviet bloc, led by Moscow, and the, and the American bloc, or NATO, led by the US, but we also had a war at home. Most people, when they think of the situation within, uh, within Russia at the time of, uh, let's say, Stalin, who was in power at the time in, in, in the Soviet Union, was, was the Soviet Union in the 50s, or the Soviet Union in general, known for its internal democracy? Obviously not. That was one of the major criticisms that the Soviet Union or the communist system might have attempted to solve social problems. The question is whether, how successful they were at that. But at least that was their declared goal. But internal, internal democracy was not one of their strong points. What happened in the United States was same thing. In order to win the Cold War against the Soviet Union, the US also was suppressing freedom of speech. Anybody who criticized the government, so I'm being very simplistic now, was threatened be, by, of a, being accused of being a communist. And if you were accused of being a communist within the US, you could lose your job. You could even go to jail. Your children would be uh, harassed at school, et cetera, et cetera. Charlie, you're very well educated. Wow. <laughs> Are you an engineer? That's yeah. civil engineer. Does that make a difference? The, the, the civil engineers are more you know, universally educated? OK, good. <laughs> I've noticed that the engineers are more interested in other stuff than most people, like nurses or pharmacists. They just do right? Whereas engineers are more, more global, right? Of course, right. Okay. <laughs> so what happens is that the US and the Soviet Union attempt to enforce the Cold War on the UN. So the first achievement of Dag Hammarskjöld is to remove the coercion that's going on within the United Nations. What the US and the Soviet Union were trying to do was to force the UN employees to choose sides. So the very first thing he has to do is clean his own house. At this time, the US was much more powerful than the Soviet Union. The US was always more powerful, but at this time, the US was dominant. So it was, the US was being successful in its attempt to force its agenda on the employees of the UN. So the first thing he did, which made him, gave, made him a, a lot of enemies in the United States, in the US government, was that he removed the people who were trying to coerce the UN staff. He said, the UN staff is neutral. We're not on the side of the US. We're not on the side of the Soviet Union. So that was a big first step. So if you move into an, of a company, and we'll see this with Franco Barnabe as well, with Franco Barnabe. Barnabe. Franco Barnabe, when he took over any, he had the same problem. If, you're, if you move into a company that is full of bad apples, what is the danger? You'll become a bad apple. What happens if you move into an institution that's full of bad apples, but you are now in charge of the barrel of bad apples? You become a bad apple. Okay, the, you, could, you have to clean it. You have to clean it up. You have to find the few good apples who are left and you get, before they get rotten, too, and remove the bad apples. So what <clears throat> Hammarskjöld did in a political sense is what Barnabe did on the level of corruption. He cleaned out the UN 
from the bad influence, the, the assumption that the UN has to serve either the, either the US or the Soviet Union. And this was a major achievement. This was really a, a switch in the internal workings of the UN. And basically, that has remained the same. The US is not internally now, as an institution, under the control of any foreign power, the employees of the UN. OK, so the next step, of course, is then to position himself in uh, upcoming conflicts. We talked about this before. What is a proxy? <clears throat> somebody who represents somebody else. So we often use this in the context of proxy wars. We know this from the Lebanese Civil War, and we're now seeing it in Syria. Foreign powers start choosing sides, and once this thing takes, its own, takes on its own uh, uh, dynamic, it's the external powers who are more powerful, who have more influence, than the actual local players. So today, you could argue that Iran and Saudi Arabia and Qatar and France and the US have more influence over the civil war in Syria than do the Syrians themselves. And that was similar in the case of the Lebanese civil war. The foreign powers had a strong influence. The proxy wars in the 50s were about another situation. Did anybody, by the way, go to the event on Nigeria on Friday? On the, no, OK, anyway, so I won't. Uh, uh, what happened after World War II was a massive wave of decolonialization. Some countries became independent in 1943. <laughs> Others had to wait till the end of the war. But by the 1950s, most of the colonies were either independent or on their way to becoming independent. Some countries had to fight wars to expel the colonial forces. For example, Indonesia was, Indonesia, by the way, what's, what's the largest Muslim country in the world? Indonesia. Indonesia. Uh, <laughs> that gave it away. OK. And who was the colonial mother country? Britain. No. Holland. The Netherlands. The Netherlands, not to be underestimated. So there was a massive war of independence in Indonesia against the Netherlands. Algeria is an example we talked about last time against France. Other countries were luckier. There was no war of independence in India, for example. Uh, so in this period of decolonialization, of course, the goal is, on the part of the Soviet Union and the part of the US, that these countries, as they become independent, should fall in line with either the US or the Soviet Union. So the first step that Hammarskjöld takes is to clean up his own house. In the case of the UN, it's political corruption or political coercion. Uh, in, cor in the corporate world, it's of often economic uh, problems. Once he's cleaned up the UN, now he has to try to find a space for countries to become independent and not be under the control of the US or the Soviet Union. Normally what happens is that both countries were using pre-existing conflicts within countries in order to find proxies. So the, one of the reason I ask about, uh, about this, in, in Africa, for example, uh, if you have a War of Secession. In Nigeria, I don't know if anybody remember, you don't remember this, but you might have heard of the Biafra War in Nigeria. It was a part of, once Nigeria became independent, a province within, was a, in the southern part of, of Nigeria, they declared themselves independent from, from Nigeria. And then there was a war between the central government and the secessionist province in the south. This is a golden opportunity for what? For, for the Soviet Union and the United States to intervene. And we had some of this happening during the Lebanese Civil War, where the Soviet Union and the US 
we're getting involved. So this is very, very common. So the goal, just so you get the context now, the goal of Hammarskjöld was one, to clean, his own, clean up his own organization and then use this moral authority to try to find a space globally for countries to be independent of both sides. Okay, so much for that. Now, uh, please now turn to page 35. Athalia, I'm going to need the, uh, the, the clock. I, my, my mobile is running out of battery. So page 35, inner dialogue. It's 98 and 99 in the actual chapter of the book. We have two, two sources. When, when, it, when it disappears, where do I have to push? Just any button. Just any button, OK. So, Epictetus, the point, the, the essential point you should get out of this, uh, if you don't have the hard copy on your desk, you can find it on Facebook or just Google it yourself. Very basically, the importance here is, okay, the importance here is, what the, reader, what the author is making the point is, continuous development of self on page 99 at the top. Continuous development of self, which means you never arrive. Now, what, yeah, and, and, but also freedom, uh, ethics, in any, in any trajectory, you never arrive. Now, does this mean that he's tending towards Kohlberg or rest? If you, he's not taking sides, obviously. But now try to use some of the other theories and apply them to Ham Hammerskjöld. The, the threat of not arriving, you have to continuously work on yourself, means what if you stop working on yourself? You'll slip back. So is he more of a Kohlbergian or Restian thinker? Rest. He's, he's aware of the fact that if you don't constantly work on yourself, you can slip back. Okay, the second point, by the way, just so you know, Rest does not only talk about the danger of backsliding, he also talks about the fact that you can be moral and immoral or ethical and unethical at the same time. You can be selective. Very good. Okay. Second is Davenport. And we're going to be dealing now with some of Davenport's thinking in the context of how to deal with the issue of faith. Uh, so now turn to 36. I'm going to read a little bit again from the text because I think this is important that we follow this. On page 100 in the actual book, 36 in the numbers that I wrote at the bottom. Taking from Davenport's The Dignity of Man. By the way, when we do this, he doesn't actually mention Davenport. He mentions an important American thinker in his speech. But we know from other readings that he's referring to Davenport. When we take one when we take one thinker and use him to try to explain another thinker. So the author is taking the writings of Davenport and actually going back to Davenport's writing to explain Hammerskjöld. What we're doing is we're explaining one text by another. So we're going between two texts. This is an important method that's used in our field, by the way, which is also science, not just the hard sciences or science, we try to show how texts are linked to each other. So if you go between texts, intertext. Shu, wa, le, ti. That's one of the words. I'll explain it in a moment. So intertextuality. What we're seeing here is a classical example of how you try to explain one thinker through referencing a second. Has anybody? He's sleeping. Give him a push. What does intertextuality mean? <laughs> no, not, not that much of a Renaissance man. OK. Intertextuality. Does, any, does anybody know the term? Hmm? 
yeah, okay. No, but has anyone heard of the theory of intertextuality? Okay. The assumption is that there are no such thing as, there's no such thing as the original author. Which is not an excuse for plagiarism, by the way. So next time you get caught plagiarizing, tell your professor, I wasn't plagiarizing. It's a clear example of intertextuality. <laughs> that'll, that'll keep them busy for like 30 seconds, right? OK. It, it, it comes from the field of cultural studies. Actually, critical cultural studies. Uh, the assumption that everything that we're dealing with is actually not only the product of other, other people's thinking, but it's also related to, p to power. How many of you believe that there's such a thing as the absolute truth? So, so, does someone give an argument? Is there such a thing as the absolute truth, or are there just different people's opinions? We've talked about this before, remember? If there's an absolute truth, what are you? Which is a Christian, which is an example of which kind of thinking? You, universalism. Universalist thinkers, whether they're Christian or Muslim or Marxist or feminist or anarchist or whatever, they would believe there is such a thing as truth. If you say the truth is relative, it depends, then you are a relativist, obviously. Okay, good. So what critical cultural studies is trying to reveal is that most of the theories that you're going to be reading and using, even in the hard sciences like physics or, or biology, are linked to power and people's interests with respect to research, and not only the content of the research, but also the funding. Classical example is very obnoxious, but there are two types of cancer which are highly gendered, which means they're either male or female. Breast cancer is not exclusively female. Men can get it too. Uh, and when men get it, they usually die because they only go to, for a checkup when it's so advanced that they, something's wrong here, right? And then it's way too late. So the, the, the one that men can get, prostate cancer. For decades, women's rights organizations were fighting a battle to get the same type of funding for breast cancer research that us guys had dedicated to prostate cancer research. So the fact that we have good breast cancer research today is a result of the feminist pressure on the medical community. So culture, criti critical cultural studies is trying to show us that research, even things as basic as cancer research, are based on power interests. If there's only a certain amount of funding for research and the men control it, where are they going to put the money? And the cancer they can get. You think that that's not possible? Would that be something that you think that's too horrible to be true? Historically, it's a fact. Google it and find, and you could go Google the, the battle for proper breast cancer research over the last couple of decades. Okay, what does that have to do with what we're talking about here? Critical cultural studies tries to show us that everything is a product of power, which means that anything that you look at scientifically is a construction. What does construction mean? That's what con means. Yeah. Okay, we have engineers here. What does construction mean? Putting things together. So if the books you're reading, the class I'm teaching, when you go to hear a sermon on Friday or on Sunday, the sermon you're listening to, somebody had to put it together. Does that person have some role in society based on power? Most likely. That's something you can't avoid. What you should be is aware of the fact that that's how it is. Is that clear, that, that concept? So if we want to find out how a sermon, when you go to pray, or a class lecture, like the one you're listening to right now, or a book that you're reading, or something you're looking on Facebook at. If it's constructed, what do you want to do? It's like Lego. You know, you all saw the movie. 
No, Lego the movie, go see it. It's not for kids. Lego the movie, one of the best philosophical statements I've seen recently. I'm serious. <laughs> it's not a movie for kids. What, what's been happening the last couple of decades is that the movies for kids have more and more content for the parents. This is the first time it tipped. This is the first time the movie is actually for parents with some content for kids. So, constructed. If things are put together like Lego, what do you want to do? Take it apart and see how it's put together. What's that called? Bravo. D. The theory of deconstruction. When you deconstruct something, you try to find out how it was put together. And this is what's happening here. Bauman is deconstructing Hammarskjöld's speech. And one of the things, one of the tools we use in deconstruction, I'm making this very simple, but just so you get the point, one of the tools we use is the concept of intertextuality. People are always referring to things either implicitly or explicitly. Explicitly means out, it's out in the open. Implicitly means everybody somehow knows what that means. This is happening all the time in Lebanese politics. People say things openly or they say things not so openly. Especially on election day when you're not allowed to have any political advertising, everything is sort of implicit. My the favorite example that I always like to use in my political science classes is the former patriarch Sfer during the last elections. He said, this time, he was speaking to the Christians, vote Arab. Remember that? This time what? Vote Arab. What did he mean? So who's the non-Arab candidate? Uh, Who, which Christian candidate is the non-Arab candidate? The Persian one, which is? Ah, he's accusing Aon of being what? A lackey, a puppet of Iran, right. So, did he say that? No, no he's not going to say it. And why did he have to say it that way? Because you're not allowed to have election speeches on Sunday, during election day. So he said it indirectly. So some of you like that, some of you don't. Okay. This is intertextuality. These are, this is happening, all, pay attention next time when you see speeches, how much of it is out in the open it, and how much of it is referring to other texts. So Davenport. Davenport is implicit in Hammerskjold's speech, and what Bauman is doing here is explaining it to us. Okay, let's now have a look at what Davenport has to say in his book, The Dignity of Man. We're at, we're at the top of page 100. 100, yes. You got it? Okay. Must we not choose between two irreconcilable views? The view of science, that the spiritual reference is not only, is not really important, that is indeed a sort of illusion that has no bearing on things as they really are, or, on the other hand, the spiritual view. What's he doing here? He's setting up, what's he doing? He's setting up two options. We're reading Davenport now. So, a dichotomy is two opposing views. And what do you do? Pay attention now, please. What do you do when you have two, when you have two opposing views? It creates what? Conflict, Conflict or? Tension. tension. Good. Okay. Are conflicts good or bad? We talked about this before. It depends. Some conflicts are good, some are bad. Some will go away, and some won't. So, when you set up a dichotomy like that, it's either science or faith. I'm creating tension. Out of that, he's going to, tr he's going to try to give us a solution. So, if it's either science or faith, we can either say, no, it's only science, or it's only faith. That's option one. Remember the four options? That's option one. Or it's only science or faith, but you can be both, but not at the same time. They complement each other, but you can't be both at the same time. 
Okay, so if anybody remembers from school, does anybody remember from school the concept of the dialectic? Does anybody remember it? What is it? Who remembers? Yes. Yeah, okay. We have thesis and we have anti thesis. Now, thank you. Okay, wait a second. Okay, now if you want to pronounce it properly, it's in English, it's antithesis. But you can say anti thesis too, it's easier to, to remember, okay? So, thesis, anti thesis. What is, this is, the, this is the concept of the dialectic. Now, there's two ways of seeing this. One is the golden mean. The ancient Greeks, the Romans, classical Rome, up until the Middle Ages, they assumed in this tension between the two options, we'll find something in between, the golden mean. But what Hegel does, you don't have to remember that, but what Hegel does is he takes it further. He says we have the, sorry about this, Synthesis. This is where they get the term synthetics, right? Synthetics are things that made, are made out of other elements that didn't exist before. What we're going to see here is how Davenport finds a synthesis between the two options, science and faith. And this is basically when you look at most of the training you're going to see. There's very few leadership any, in any field, by the way. There's very few leadership training modules or courses that don't talk about personal, personal development. A lot of them start. Work on yourself. This is basics. This is standard now for most training programs. Work on yourself. But of course, how? W with what? So one of these sources where you can get your concepts of right or wrong and also the energy that you need to do the right thing because we know what's the difference between a good good and a good bad dilemma? It's easy to judge or recognize cognitively. It's, easily, it's easy to know what's right, but it's difficult. So we always need the energy to do the right thing, even when we, when we know what's right or wrong. But good good is? It's even hard to judge. It's hard, even hard to know. So, and office, obviously religion offers a way of, new, of doing that, as does science, but can they work together? So what's he saying? You have these two options. What's the synthesis going to be? The synthesis is going to be, I'll spoil, spoiler alert, I'll give it away now. The synthesis is a secular concept of the spiritual. Or of belief. What does that mean? A sec well, by the way, before we go any further, what does secular mean? Secular? Yeah. Secular is uh, the, uh, the, uh, depends on the criteria. Well, no, what, what, it, it, secular is a, is a very simple word. What does it mean? It means, it means non-sacred. This is a secular room. We only have one sacred room at our university. The chapel. And by the way, if you want to visit me in my office, my office is literally right beside the chapel. So I get a lot of you know, good vibes from the, and also the smells are very you know, strong sometimes. OK, so you want to find me, I'm right beside the chapel. OK, that's a, that's a sacred room. How do you make a room sacred? You have a ceremony. And it becomes a sacred room. If you would say, if the chapel moves to another building, what do they have to do before they move out? They have to, the ceremony to desanctify it. First of all, you sanctify it by having prayers and some rituals. And then when you move, you desanctify it. It's just a room, but it has a special purpose. So se secular means non sacred. So we have secular music. Elvis is, some people think it's sacred music. They think Elvis is God, but he's not. Uh, it's, it's, no, I'm sorry, <laughs> no, one put, no one broke that to you. Okay, so sa sacred music is the music of the religions. Secular music is not atheist music. It's non 
sacred. So take that. So a secular approach to the spiritual or to belief. Keep that in mind. Okay, we're going to see how he gets there. But he, what he's doing is he's, cut, he's setting up these, this conflict, allowing us to get to a third option. Okay. Towards the bottom of the same text, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven lines up. Eight, eight. It has become not a reality, but okay. He who would inquire into the inner world has three choices to make. You got, everybody, everybody got, got the point in the reading? Three choices. He'll use the thesis and antithesis, and then he'll move on to the synthesis. Three choices. He may return to the churches and seek to reanimate into himself the deep convictions and, seek, uh, and, and insights which they represent and through which they molded Western civilization. Already in the 1950s, we're confronted with a world which is becoming less and less religious. So actually, he, he, he says, return to religion, because most people are turning their backs on the church. And by here, here, by the way, the word church is written with a small c. What does that mean? What is it in English, what is the distinction between a capital and a small letter? Uppercase, lowercase. It's a, yeah, it's a proper, so for example, if I'm for social justice, doesn't mean I'm a socialist. If I'm a, if I believe in conserving, preserving traditions, doesn't make me a member of the conservative party in the UK. So church with a capital C is the church. Whereas church with a small c means what? It means the body of of believers, body of believers. So he says churches, he means of course all the churches. The Christian churches, the Muslim churches, the Jewish churches, the Hindu churches. He means the, the believers. As a, so one option is to, is faith. This is where we started from. If he cannot bring himself to this, this is an interesting statement. If he cannot bring himself to this, I know, I mean, I'm assuming that <laughs> a lot of you guys are like my students in the political science department. They have a lot of, a lot of students have a sort of an aversion to it. They're almost allergic to religion. They get, they get aggressive when I talk about religion. Uh, so for a lot of people, they've had negative experiences for whatever reason. I'm not going to go into that. They, want, they turn their back and they say, no, I can't. I can't actually return to religion. So what does he say here? If you can't bring yourself to this, he may follow the path of science into the field of psychiatry and content himself chi chiefly with the therapy that it has to offer. So this is not the only option, by the way. I mean, you can, we, we saw that psychiatry or uh, psychology is one approach to uh, ethics. What's another one? Take the, other, the previous reading. Besides psychology, what other way can you approach ethics? <coughs> Philosophy or practical action. There's different approaches, but they're all non-religious. They're all outside of the, of the, of the assumption of that there is something spiritual. Let's now see what he offers as the synthesis. <coughs> or refusing both of these, he may strive to give the word spiritual, you see it? The word spiritual, in quotation marks, a content capable of revealing the realities of the inner world to himself and to others in living terms. So, the synthesis. I don't want to be just faith. I don't want to be just science. So I need a new approach to spiritual. Yes. Thank you for asking that. No. What Hegel what, okay, that's, that's, that's an important question. Hegel, by the way, if you really want to get smart, take tango lessons. <laughs> Ask her after class why. Okay. Uh, especially for engineers <laughs> in their fifth year. Okay, uh, what is the difference between the golden mean, which is the classical Greek approach, and the synthesis? As you said, somewhere in between would be the golden mean which was the way we saw this dialectic up until the Middle Ages. What Hegel and Marx 
later on did, and I won't go into the difference between the two if you're really interested. They use the term in German, they're both German, Aufheben, which you don't need to know, and I won't put it on the test, but Aufheben means two things. It means to get rid of, to abolish, and it also means to lift up. So what the dialectic does, and this is the difference between the golden mean, which is somewhere in between the two, and the synthesis is, it gets rid of the tension and it lifts it to a higher level. We talked about the distinction between conflict resolution and conflict, remember? Transformation. The whole nature of this interaction is transformed. It becomes something new. It's lifted up to a higher level. So he's, he's, he's saying here, Davenport's saying here, that through this tension we reach something new, a reevaluation of the concept of the spiritual. And the, the issue here is that belief and spirituality do not have to be rooted in the existence of a divine being. What does that mean? What, is it, what does the divine assume? Something beyond the material. Something beyond the material. So he's, he's, he's proposing here a concept of belief or spirituality that goes beyond any of the religions that we know of today. By the way, he's a very devout Christian, but he's trying to find a language that is a sec accessible for people who aren't believers. <clears throat> Let me give you an example. Deontological thinking. We talked about this, right? What's your name again? I forgot. See, this is, this is the disadvantage of me not taking attendance, that I don't know the name. Marino. 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 Okay. Good. Marino. Marino. Mar Mar <laughs> okay, good. Marino walks into a hospital, remember? Perfectly healthy. There are five people who need organ parts. So what do we do? We chop up Marino and save five lives. The answer is no, we don't do that. Do I need God to say no? No. In some situations you might, but in this situation do I? Do I say that human life is sacrosanct? Excuse the word sacrosanct, which is a religious connotation. Human life cannot be sacrificed unless it's a very, very exceptional situation, like for example, war or self-defense. But just to save five lives, I don't chop up a merino. So I'm taking a choice, I have a choice here between deontological and utilitarian. utilitarian. To, to, when you decide between the utilitarian and deontological, do you need God? No. But this belief in the value of human life, if someone would come to me and argue the case for torture. It's a better example. We all know the movie, the TV show 24, right? Yeah. We talked about it before, the last year, the last season. Uh, but there's, there's many examples in, the, in 24 they have to decide, should we use torture or not? And the TV show always comes down on the side of torture, right? Because it's cool to show torture on TV. Okay, but showing non-torture wouldn't get as many viewers. But Torture is absolutely forbidden, like slavery. There are, under no circumstances is slavery admissible. Under no circumstances is torture admissible, for whatever reason. Now, do I need God to say that? The world has decided, it's in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the world has decided slavery is not possible. Killing people is. War, self-defense, it's possible. There are certain circumstances, but slavery and torture are not. So when I make the deontological decision, no slavery, no torture, and I'm now Jack Bauer, right? You know, the bomb's gonna go off in California, right? One million people are gonna die. Should I torture one to save a million? No. Under no circumstances, because once you start that, you have a slippery slope. A slippery slope, you know, you're going down a hill, and it's raining, and as you, as you start slipping, boom, and where are we going to end with this? So, under no circumstances, you cannot torture people under any circumstances. 
so let's say, wait, wait, let's, now Jack Bauer walks in, we all have seen, if you haven't seen 24, go get it, it's like, it's addictive, you can't just watch one, you say, hey, to your friend, let's watch one or two 24 see, uh, shows. You start at 10, it's 4 in the morning, you're still watching, right? It's addictive. Okay, so you're watching 24, now Jack Bauer walks into your room. Amazing. And he makes a good argument for torture. What would stop you from listening to him saying, no, no, this belief, this belief that goes beyond reasoning, what gives you this core belief that you can actually stand up to Jack Bauer making the argument for torturing this man. This is, this, this is the point that... There's a million more who are going to lie. Yeah, if you do it once, you can do it twice. You can do it three times. No way. We're not going to do this. And we're not going to enslave people. There's a temp Historically, how did people become slaves? Hmm? It's not, no, it's not skin color. It's not language, it's not colonialism. Historically, most people who became slaves became slaves because of debt. So, a family is indebted, they have two options. They can sell off a family member, pay off the debt. Or, somebody can go in to enslave himself and work it off. You work for your owner for 10 years and then you're free again. You're not allowed to do that anymore. I'm sorry, you can't sell yourself into slavery even if you want to. No, it's illegal. So, this is why these two issues, but can we find a way of justifying this using this synthetic approach? What is Hammers Hammerskill going to say here? Okay, we, we, we're, up to, we're up to the point here on, on page 101. Let's move on to page 37. 103 in the actual book. His tool, his, his, the way he's, he proposes doing this, we've had this before, but I'm just going to go over it again. Uh, okay. Is inner dialogue. Let's go over the steps again. This is, this, this is the last time we're going to deal with this before the test, unless you have questions. Uh, once you are become aware, make a list of where your core values come from, from your experience. Hammerskjold, is, he grew up in Sweden, rule of law. He's a devout Christian. He's a socialist, and he has a lot of positive experiences in government service. That's where it comes from. He tests himself by throwing himself into adversity and comparing his thinking to other people and finds the overlap, the common values that he can share with others. And then he goes out and does it again. And he, he says, constantly testing yourself. But when he tries to sell that to you, he's going to tell you, okay, you can have religion. Or you can have just science, but for those of you who are not comfortable with just religion or just science, this, this concept of the, the new spiritual. When you have inner dialogue, what are you hearing? What are you ta who's talking dialogue? What does it mean? No, wrong. Okay, okay, guys. If, you put that on, if, you, if that's the answer on the test, it's wrong. It's not dialogue, so if there's three people, it's trialogue. Dia does not mean D. D means two. Dia means across or through. So dia logos means through talking. So who are you dialoguing with when you're talking to yourself? <laughs> does Hammerskjold actually tell us? Let's have a look now. Page 103. In the, it's 37 in the number that I gave, but it's 103, first full paragraph. What strikes us, you have it? What strikes us in, this, in his text, in, in his text, Hammerskjold makes no statement about what actually constitutes the inner dialogue, while at the same time he grants this a fundamental place as part of human dignity and the pursuit of maturity of mind. Remember, where, what we try to aspire to is maturity of mind through the steps that I've described up until now. But to continue the process of maturity of mind, we need to constantly have inner dialogue. And this is where this concept of the spiritual, with quotation marks, the non-sacred, non, not necessarily sacred, concept of spiritual and belief. I don't do this because someone's argued the case. I will not enslave somebody. I will not torture somebody. 
And that's a belief. So let's continue. No speaking about the inner dialogue is a con not speaking about the inner about the inner dialogue was a conscious choice for Hammerskjöld. Whatever way he would fill it in, it would miss the meaning and effect of the inner dialogue, which is the privilege of the responsible individual person. And it gives an example of he actually had a meditation room in the UN for people. He, he set up the structures in the UN for that. Now, before we conclude. Uh, good. Last point. We talked about the concept of secular. What does secular mean? This is a secular approach to maturity of mind. What does secular mean? Non-sacred. So can I have somebody come up and write the word secularism in Arabic on the board. Almania, right? Who wants to write? Who can write Arabic? None of you? Can you write Arabic? Oh, come on, come on, write it up. Okay. Almania. Almania. Okay. So, in English, secular. Ism. The ism, what does that mean? It's an ideology. An ideology. Now write a word that you probably haven't ever heard before. Almana. Almana. What does it mean? Like the Almania. Almana. I'm assuming she wrote it right. <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. The distinction, guys, guys, guys. The distinction is secularism means a complete removal of faith. That's one of the two options either science or religion. You want science? No religion. That's secularism. Secularity. Please write it down. This is important. Secularity is a separation of the institutions of the church and the institutions of the state. There's a huge difference. Guys, is Lebanon a completely secular country? What is the clear example of this not being the case? Which part of the government is controlled by the religious institutions? The, no. No. The family status courts. Marriage, divorce, inheritance. This is controlled by the 18 recognized denominations. We have three religions in Lebanon and 18 denominations, or confessions as it's often called. The three religions are Jewish, Christian, and Muslim. The denominations, are, I, I usually get lost at 16. I, uh, so each one has a court, including the Jews, in case you don't know that. And you can go buy all their law books. They're in the government printing office. So this is a clear example of a non-secular state. The opposite of a secular state is a theocratic state. OK, let me see. How much time do we have left? We got what, what? We go to 50, okay? Five more minutes. Okay. Secularity accepts faith in politics. It just doesn't want to have a mixture of the two. Why is this relevant? Why is this relevant for what we're talking about here? What he's trying to do is to give you a secular in the sense of secularity. A secular argument for spirituality. Now, how's that possible? How is it possible to have a secular argument for spirituality? What does secular mean? It means non-sacred, rational. He's using rational argumentation, using the dialectic, 
to say that we have to have some level of moral absolutes and something that is above the material. And, and the method he uses is inner dialogue. Now, then it's up to you. He doesn't say how to do it. Why does he say not? I mean, if you would ask him how he does it, I'm sure he would bring up the word God. But he's not going to say it in his speech. Why? That would turn off the others. What he's saying to you is take some time every day and do what? Pray or talk to yourself or just be quiet. Guys, I'm recommending, my fingers are blue. What I'm recommending is try it. How much would it cost you to do this for three days in a row? First thing in the morning, sit still for 20 minutes. Try it and see what happens. You'll hear something. Maybe it's your own subconscious. Maybe it's your conscience. Maybe it's God. That's up to you. But what we're seeing here is a spiritual justification, a secular justification for spirituality, and that's why it's put in quotations. Good. See you on Tuesday, and you know the homework? Next chapter. Thank you.